I'm going to go ahead and uh, open the breakfast meeting of the Surgical History Group at 7 o'clock and please uh, continue to get food and get settled down. Uh, I want to make sure we get through the entire agenda, so I'll just go ahead and start. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this agenda will have an archi archives update with Megan. I'll go over some of the updates for the Surgical History Group. Mary is going to uh, give an update regarding the Marin College of Surgeons Foundation and then the poster session awards. We had a great poster session. And um, uh, I'll give the awards for that. And then Dr. Cameron is going to give his keynote address. Uh, Megan, can you begin? Good morning. Um, I'm going to give a very brief update uh, about the archives at the college this year. Um, so the mission of the archives is to advance the goals of the college by acquiring, preserving, and providing access to the college's records of enduring value. Uh, our 2017-2018 activities are pretty online with previous years. Um, we did 170 research requests this year, um, had about the same number of in-person visits at 13, and accessioned 31 new collections to our um, archives. Um, some of the highlights of the new accessions are primarily college records. So we got new records from cancer programs, um, ATLS, um, a lot of new photographs, particularly from Clinical Congress over the past 10 years or so. Um, integrated communications records, some Board of Regents material, and um, various different committee, including the graduate med medical education. Our 2018 activities in terms of the web, um, we continue to provide access to all of our online materials through the archives website, and you can get there at facts.org slash archives. Um, you can learn all about the history of the college on our website. Um, we also detail all the surgical history group activities. They have their own page. And we also provide updates to the 25 and 50 year anniversary fellow um, web pages. And essentially what we do is we upload photographs, um, the full convocation booklet, as well as all the clinical Congress news from those 25 and 50 year anniversary years. So our um, past fellows can go look online and reminisce about their um, initiate year. We've also done a lot with collections care and administration this year. We're developing a policy guide as well as a processes and procedures manual. Um, we're continuing to implement our oral history search tool, which we um, started last year. Um, the previous four oral histories we did of past presidents are now available to full search. And uh, we continue to do that with our previous interviews as well. And this year we revamped the surgical history group poster session submission process. So I'm sure some of you submitted to that this year and hopefully found it a lot easier because the process is completely online now, which makes it easier both for um, submitters as well as the people on the other end. Megan had a session of her own. She has a new daughter named Claire, and so uh, we're happy to hear that. And we have a uh, new assistant archivist, Michael Beasley. So Michael, can you stand? Michael's back there. He'll, he and Megan are great help. Uh, again, our mission, uh, these are executive committee. We'll be going over some people are coming off uh, the executive committee. Uh, some people are uh, coming on, like Patrick Griffinstein and Carol Scott Connor. Uh, the history group, uh, uh, the archives committee uh, uh, came through with the bulletin articles that you see here, and I'm sure we've been following them with the bulletin of the Marin College of Surgeons. They're fantastic uh, reads, they're short, they're very accessible. Uh, we had a compilation of the poster papers again this year, this time 10 posters were featured uh, because of funding. We can't do this again, this is unfortunate. This might be a funding opportunity through the foundation. These are events. We had, uh, as I said, a, a poster session starting yesterday. The posters are still up in the exhibit hall. Uh, the Ether Dome Tour, which we're anticipating, uh, is going to be meeting at 9 o'clock. Uh, Megan's got details as to where to meet. This is a, a, a sold out event. You need your ticket to be admitted to this. Icons of Sergi will follow uh, the Eat the Dome Tour at 11.30. It's going to be at 156 A, B, and C, which is upstairs. Um, being featured is our very own uh, Dr. Cameron, who will be giving the keynote address later, and Kenneth Ford. And then tomorrow is going to be uh, another Icons and Surgery session. Uh, the panel session, which we're anticipating, is organized by Eric Elster of the University of Services, University of the Health Sciences. Uh, they'll be uh, as you see there, we're looking forward to that too. This is the centennial, of course, of the armistice of World War I 
and appropriately, this is the, all the papers will be on World War I. Uh, don't forget your baseball cards. I, they, I haven't seen them advertised as being on sale on eBay quite yet, but I'm sure they will be. Uh, the community is, uh, the, the community excel, it's, itself is, uh, <laughs> as you know, it's a labor of love for me, but I think we're having increasing participation. Uh, we welcome volunteers to contribute an online topic or any sort of surgeon of local or national or international interest, please, uh, please participate. This is the first year of the Archives Fellowship. This is the Foster Scholar Study using the Archives of the American College of Surgeons. The grant is $2,000 for one year. The first recipient is uh, David Clark, who will be uh, giving an a update on his uh, research at next year's breakfast meeting. Mary, do you have uh, something about the foundation? While she's coming up, um, there's a uh, walking tour. So if you uh, take a break from the sessions, you can go to Mount Auburn Cemetery. Inside this uh, is a map of the grave sites of interest, including that of Ernest Codman that was sponsored by the college, and Lamar was instrumental in getting that done. Mary? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the chance just to um, a uh, tell you about the uh, foundation. The reason I'm here is that um, some, the uh, number of initiatives that the Surgical History Group are en are engaged in are growing, and um, uh, this is uh, something that um, uh, the foundation is eager to support if we have the ability to do so. The mission of the foundation is is listed on this. Um, slide, but we've enhanced it a bit because, as some of you know, and as I'm always fond of reminding everyone, that our dues only pay for about 23 percent of what the college does. So dues that we pay as members of the college take care of the bulletin, uh, publications, the advisory councils, the governors, the, all the committees, the Washington building, uh, the part of NISQIP that isn't covered by the uh, user fees. Uh, and the Clinical Congress, which is much more expensive than the registration is. Uh, the, there's other income. Uh, income comes from uh, charges for the users of the accreditation programs and so forth, and also products that are sold, the DVDs and the educational sessions, um, the exhibitor fees, and then the policy of the college is to always take 5% each year from endowment. But the big problem is that every year there are more and more programs that don't generate any revenue, that these are all costly. Uh, obviously, the scholarships and fellowships in here alone, uh, this year we're uh, funding 63 scholarships and fellowships uh, to, uh, the, and, uh, to generally about $1.5 million just for that. And all of the other things that go in here, Operation Giving Back and so forth, uh, are all non-revenue generating. And the big issue is that by pouring money into those, it's hard to keep coming up with uh, wonderful new initiatives that people are within the college and, and the fellows are eager to do. Uh, things that would be investments in new exploratory proposals or future programs or things that eventually may be revenue generating. And as a rule in the American College of Surgeons, this type of thing, this kind of R&D has been underfunded. So the, uh, we know that um, uh, there's many programs that are supported solely through contributions to the, to the foundation. And we also know that anything that's new initiatives and so forth are funded solely through contributions to the foundation. And so each year we sit, out, we sit down now and we gather up with all of the divisions and the groups and the surgical history group a menu of the funding opportunities that are out there so that people can uh, uh, invest in the things that they're particularly interested in and they can help to launch these new programs. And for the surgical history group, again, I would mention we have these uh, uh, goals that have to be met each year for uh, funds for the traveling fellowship, the collections, the archives, and of course, um, as you just mentioned, the, uh, Dr. Clark next year. So this is the page. If you go to facs.org in the upper right-hand corner, it says donate now. And um, when, when you hit the donate button, it takes you to the foundation webpage. 
there's a pull-down menu, and in that pull-down menu, it says archive surgical history. So if you have, if that's where you want to and uh, make your gift this year, go to the pull-down menu and direct it directly to the surgical history group at archives. And thank you very much for the opportunity to tell you about this and where to find it. Thank you. The poster session this year was run by Richard Lynn of uh, Palm Beach, and he couldn't make it because of other pressing commitments, but it was a success. We had 90 submissions, we had 20 competitors, and uh, anyone, ev everyone who attended was impressed by the level of scholarship and the earnestness of the uh, young surgeons who were involved. Uh, this year, the first place was uh, Jack Earhart, uh, carbolic acid before Joseph Lister. I have to make sure that people know that the two co-authors were recused themselves, of course. And then the second place is uh, Justin Julian, uh, John Howard, a pioneer of vascular trauma and pancreatic surgery. So will uh, doctors uh, Earhart and Julian please come up and accept their awards. The posters will remain up until Wednesday morning, and so I encourage everyone, if they have an odd moment after the, during the, your visits to exhibit halls, uh, please, uh, please give the posters themselves a look. They are, they are remarkable. Uh, this year, the keynote address will be uh, by Dr. Cameron, who really doesn't need any in introduction to this group, certainly. Uh, he's Alfred Blaylock, Distinguishing Service Professor of Surgery at the Johns Hopkins University. School of Medicine. His uh, accomplishments are legion, including being president of the American College of Surgeons. He was, uh, he's held a number of leadership uh, uh, positions for the college. He was uh, president of the American Surgical Association, the Southern Surgical, the Halstead Society, the Society of Surgical Chairs, the Sur Society of Surgical Elementary Tract, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, he's Emeritus Chief of Surgery at the Johns Hopkins hospital and uh, we're proud to have Dr. Cameron here to give our keynote address this year. Dr. Cameron. Well, thank you, Don, for uh, that very nice invitation, uh, introduction, and I thank all of you for getting up early this morning to come to a uh, surgical history talk. <clears throat> Generally, still um, at my age, when I go someplace, I talk about the Whipple or pancreatic cancer, but my favorite topics are surgical, and um, J.M.T. Finney is a wonderful individual. Who knows who J.M.T. Finney was? Raise your hand. A few of you <laughs> do. Uh, he started at Hopkins the same day that Dr. Halstead did, May 7th, uh, 1889. And from probably the last 10 or 12 years of Dr. Halstead's life, from say 1910 to 1922 when he died, Dr. Halstead was not the most famous surgeon at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. J.M.T. Finney was. He was known throughout the country as a marvelous surgeon. He was the first president of the, American, of the American College of Surgeons, but he didn't make any basic substantial contribution that has lasted, so his name has gradually faded. Whereas Dr. Halstead made so many contributions that after he died, his name has subsequently just each year increased in prominence. But let me tell you about Dr. Finney. He was a wonderful person. He was born in Natchez, Mississippi during the Civil War. His father, who was from Maryland, um, but at the time had a small congregation in Greenwood, Mississippi, um, lived in Natchez. 
Dr. Finney was the second of two boys. His dad, Ebenezer, was a Presbyterian minister. His mother, Dr. Finney's mother, died when he was five months old from typhoid fever, and he was raised by four different foster mothers. Now, when Dr. Finney was eight, his dad uh, received a congregation back in Maryland, so they moved back uh, to uh, Bel Air. This is a picture of Ebenezer with his two boys. The older boy, Billy, is standing. The younger boy, uh, JMT, is sitting on his lap. This is another photograph taken about the same time. You can see JMT was a very serious uh, young man. He's sitting in a chair. This is Dr. Finney at age eight when they moved back to Bel Air. Bel Air uh, was the city, the, the, the birthplace of John Wilkes Booth, who just six years earlier had uh, assassinated President Lincoln. Dr. Finney had a normal childhood. <clears throat> when he graduated from high school, he wanted to go to the brand new Johns Hopkins University, which had just opened. Uh, six years earlier, and they had a special science program, but Dr. Finney's high school background wasn't strong enough, so he, he wasn't admitted. So he went to the College of New Jersey, where his father and his grandfather had both graduated, uh, subsequently named Princeton. Uh, he graduated in three years uh, on his 21st birthday. Again, just a very ordinary student. He did play football, however, for Princeton. He's in the front row with the, the F on him. This is his graduation picture, 21 years old, very handsome uh, young man. He then entered Harvard Medical School, and there became a very serious, very good student. Uh, he was a Presbyterian. His father, his brother were Presbyterian uh, ministers, his grandfather also. And he started at the Trinity Presbyterian Church. He attended there where Phillips Brooks, a very famous Presbyterian minister who played a huge role in New England uh, at that, during that era. Dr. Finney also played <clears throat> football for Harvard his freshman year. He's the only individual who's ever played varsity football for both Harvard uh, and Princeton. Now, a medical school <clears throat> at Harvard at the time was three years in length. But it took Dr. Finney four years to graduate because during his third year of medical school, he developed typhoid fever, was admitted to the, Mar the Massachusetts General Hospital, and for the first two weeks was in a coma, and they thought he was going to die. But finally, he recovered, and after a two-month hospitalization at MGH, uh, was discharged. So he and his older brother, Bill, uh, went to Florida for virtually a year uh, for him to rehabilitate. His sophomore year, he developed abdominal pain, which was thought to be appendicitis, and was examined by Dr. Reginald Fitz, the pathologist physician who wrote the first accurate description of acute uh, appendicitis. And he was thought to have it, but they were so modern at the time that they decided to treat it non-operatively, and he obviously uh, recovered without antibiotics. This is a uh, picture of Dr. Finney. He's the second from your left with the F. It appears that to, to be a Harvard medical student at the time, you had to have a handsome mustache. He graduated uh, from Harvard Medical School in 1888. He was an outstanding student, and because he did so well, he was awarded a rotating internship, about the only postgraduate post training available at that time. And he served as a, they called it house pupil from 1888 to 1889. Now, when he was at Harvard, uh, his favorite lecturers were Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, David Cheever, Bowditch, Reginald Fitz, and his, the surgeons that he most admired were John Collins, Warren, Porter, Holmes, M.H. Richardson, who was probably the most prominent surgeon in America at the time, and Cabot. Now, during his rotating internship, he wrote Halstead a letter and said he would like to come visit because he knew this new hospital was about to open and he wanted to go back to his home state and work there. So he visited Hopkins, but unfortunately, Dr. Halstead uh, was uh, in Europe. But William H. Welch, the first pathologist 
and first dean of the school when it was to open later, uh, hosted him, showed him the unfinished Hopkins Hospital and said he would talk to Dr. Halstead. Well, Dr. Halstead later, a few months later, wrote Finney and invited him to the opening of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. This is a picture of Hopkins in 1889, May 7th, the day it opened. The hospital had been designed by John Shaw Billings, who the trustees had sent to Europe to study uh, modern hospital design. And when Hopkins opened, it was thought to be the most modern, up-to-date hospital uh, in, the, in the world. These are the first four faculty members. It's a famous uh, portrait painted by John Singer Sargent. Welch is sitting uh, on the left, your left. Uh, he was a famous pathologist and bacteri bacteriologist, and later in his career was probably the most prominent medical educator in the world. Uh, in the middle is William Osler, who if not the most famous physician that's ever lived, is probably second to Hippocrates. <clears throat> to your right is Howard Kelly, who was supposedly the most brilliant technical surgeon in the country, a gynecologist who sort of founded the field of operative gynecology, and then Dr. Halstead standing in the background. <clears throat> it is alleged that John Singer Sargent did not like Halstead because of his cryptic wit, and therefore painted his face in colors that were to fade. And it looks like he was successful because the countenance of the other three are illuminated, but his is faded. So Finney, uh, after the formal ceremony, went up and introduced himself to Dr. Halstead. Dr. Halstead said, big crowd, isn't it? Finney, yes, sir. Halstead, nice day, isn't it? Finney, yes, sir. Halstead, I'll have to ask you to excuse me as I have an appointment. What time can you report to duty? Finney, I beg your pardon, sir. Halstead, oh, I want you to come down here and work in the surgical dispensary. When can you begin? Finney said the whole discussion took up less than two minutes, and there wasn't any discussion of compensation because there wasn't any. <laughs> so when Halstead, uh, when Finney uh, finished, he came down to Hopkins. Now, his comments while at the Massachusetts General Hospital as a rotating intern, he said antisepsis was not wholly accepted and most surgeons operated in their black Prince Albert coats buttoned up tight. The instruments were rarely cleaned and most of the surgery was still done in patients' homes, even in Boston at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And Finney, in his autobiography, wrote, coming from the Massachusetts General Hospital, rich in traditions and closely linked with names and events prominent in the medical field and surgical annals, not only of Boston and New England, but of the whole uh, world of medicine. To the Johns Hopkins Hospital, with no traditions and no past, looking only to the future was like stepping out of one world uh, into another. Now, Finney was placed in charge of the outpatient clinics. He didn't have operating privileges at Hopkins because only Dr. Halstead and his chief resident had operating privileges. So he did most of his operations in patients' homes and also became associated with probably the most prominent private hospital in the city, the Union Protestant Infirmary, which subsequently was renamed Union Memorial Hospital and which still exists and which still is an excellent hospital. But as time passed um, and he gained the confidence of Dr. Halstead, he sort of became his second in charge. And whenever Dr. Halstead was out of town, which was frequent, um, Finney was in charge. This is a photograph of the early uh, Hopkins faculty. In the front row is, uh, I don't know if I can get this arrow to work or not, but in the front row is uh, Dr. Halstead with his silk top hat Next to him, Dr. Osler with a bowler, but he doesn't have it on. Here is Kelly, Howard Kelly, and then over here is uh, JMT Finney, so the early faculty at the hospital. Now, when Dr. Halstead had a brand new operating room constructed for him, he performed the first operation and it was photographed and it's called the All-Star Operation. It wasn't really an All-Star Operation. If you look closely, you can see Dr. Halstead 
has a mallet in his hand, and they were operating on a young boy with osteomyelitis. But Halstead was the operating surgeon. Directly across from him, his first assistant, J.M.T. Finney, on Finney's right was uh, Cushing. Um, Hugh Hampton Young is in this picture, the first uh, urologist. Bacher, the first radiologist. It's a very well-known uh, photograph. Now, Finney not only became a busier and busier surgeon, eventually to also obtain uh, operating privileges at Hopkins, but he came became closely integrated into the community. He served on the Baltimore City School Board, the Maryland State Board of Education. He chaired the Baltimore chapter of the National Red Cross. He was chairman of the board of trustees of two prominent uh, boys' schools in uh, Baltimore, Gilman and McDonough School. He was on the board of trustees of Lincoln University, which was in Oxford, Pennsylvania, a historically black university, uh, the, first uni the first institution in the United States to, to uh, award degrees, graduate degrees to African Americans. And he was on the board of trustees of his alma mater, Princeton University, of which he was uh, most proud. Now, amazingly, <clears throat> When Woodrow Wilson resigned as president of Princeton University to become governor of New Jersey, they didn't know who to um, should succeed him. Woodrow Wilson was such a popular president. They finally offered the job to J.M.T. Finney, a surgeon uh, in Baltimore. This is the article in the New York Times, which. Uh, uh, verifies that he was offered the Princeton, the uh, presidency of Princeton. Now, he loved and was devoted to Princeton, but he was also devoted to his practice uh, to Hopkins and to Union Memorial Hospital in Baltimore, so eventually turned it down. Now, because of the proximity of Hopkins uh, to Washington, D.C., he became the physician and good friend of Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Warren Hardy, and Calvin Coolidge. He actually operated on Theodore Roosevelt's daughter, Alice, in the White House uh, for appendicitis. Now this is Franklin H. Martin. Let me see a show of hands who, know who knows who he was. A few more, but most don't. Now he was a gynecologist. If he was a general surgeon, we would all know his name well because he was prominent in the beginning of surgery in this country, the era of modern surgery, but is basically uh, not remembered by most of us. Franklin H. Mar Martin was a fiery, red-headed gynecologist in Chicago. And in the early 1900s, he decided there needed to be a surgical journal owned by surgeons and run by surgeons. The surgical journals back in that era were owned by private business, by publishing firms. And so Martin felt we ought to have our own journal. So he started SGNO, which gradually became more and more popular and for decades was the most prominent surgical journal in the country. Now, subsequently it was surpassed by the annals SGNO, of course, was taken over some years ago uh, by the college and is now the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, but a very prominent place in American surgery. Five years later, in 1910, <clears throat> again, Martin, knowing that most surgery in this country was done by general practitioners who had little or no surgical training, decided to start a clinical congress each year. And the clinical congress that he formed, he decided should be in large cities where there were several prominent, well-trained surgeons, and they should have operative clinics. So the first one was in Chicago, Martin's hometown, and Martin was one of the surgeons. Ochsner, who at the time was from Chicago, operated J.B. Murphy, uh, Cab and others very prominently. Well, they, they expected 200 surgeons from around the country, quote, surgeons. They were really mostly general practitioners. And over a thousand showed up. So they repeated it the next year, 1911 in Philadelphia, a big crowd. <clears throat> 1912 in New York City, 
over 2,500 showed up. So obviously it was something that was in great need and it was uh, probably elevating the care of surgery in the country. So a year later in 1913, again, Martin's idea, he decided there should be an American College of Surgeons loosely based on the Royal College of Surgeons of England, Edinburgh, and Ireland. And the purpose was to raise the standard of surgical practice and improve the care of the surgical patient. This is all Franklin H. Mar Martin, a remarkable individual. And again, I don't know whether the gynecologists know anything of him. The uh, surgeons don't, but had he been a general surgeon, his name would be listed prominently with all the other initiators uh, of surgery, in, of modern era of surgery in this country. Now, they had to decide who would be the first president. Now, <clears throat> this, this college was to be a role model to show young surgeons in the country what they should emulate, what they should train, what they should strive to be. And there could have been many, many prominent first presidents. William Stewart Halstead was still in his prime, the Mayo brothers, Rudolph Mattis, the most prominent surgeon uh, from the South in New Orleans and a very popular individual. W.W. W. Keene, who had an eight volume textbook of surgery, which was the textbook of surgery at the time. J.B. Murphy from Chicago, John Collins Warrens. There were a lot of people to pick from, but they didn't pick any of them. They picked J.M.T. Finney because he thought, they, the, the Board of Regents thought Finney was the role model to which everyone should strive. Uh, and so he became the first president of the American College of Surgeons, a remarkable pick and a great pick. This is a picture of Finney at the time. He was 50 years old. This is the portrait. They used to paint the portrait uh, of, of the presidents. Now, I'm just going to give a couple of uh, Ep uh, uh, parts of his presidential address. What is consummated here tonight is destined to produce a deep and lasting impression upon medical progress, not alone in the United States and Canada, but indirectly the world over. Very prophetic. <clears throat> it, his talk was very evangelistic. I, I don't know if it would go over today, but it, it was just what the country needed at the time. The aim of this organization and the reason for its existence lie in its disinterested and unselfish efforts <clears throat> to elevate the standards of the profession, moral as well as intellectual, to foster research, to educate the public up to the idea that there is a difference between the honest, conscientious, well-trained surgeon and the purely commercial operator, the charlatan, the quack. Furthermore, that the term surgeon means something more than a suave man or a glib tongue a private hospital, a press agent, and the all too easily acquired diploma with its accompanying title of doctor. Also at the time, fee splitting was a major issue in the United States and was to remain a major issue. And that was one of the goals of the college to prevent it. Now, when World War I came along, <coughs> Finney uh, did not have to go in, but enlisted, and he became the chief consultant in surgery for the American Expeditionary Force. He went in as a colonel and uh, was eventually promoted uh, to Brigadier General and was given the Distinguished Service Medal upon discharge. This is a picture of uh, Dr. Finney as a colonel. Uh, this is a picture. It's, there are a lot of famous people in this picture. It's, it's hard to point them out. Dr. Finney is sitting in the middle. Harvey Cushing is directly behind him. Um, Hugh Hampton Young beside him. There are a lot of people. This is the uh, American Expeditionary Force of which Finney was the chief. Now, let me tell you another little story. John McRae <clears throat> was a Canadian, an internist, who trained in Canada but came down to Hopkins for a fellowship and spent two years at Hopkins uh, during uh, Finney's early days, and they became very, very close friends. Now, McCrae was in Belgium and France before Finney arrived because Canada actually entered World War I uh, before America did. McCrae apparently was a wonderful individual and was at a funeral, this is in Belgium, for a colleague of his. 
And afterwards, he was noted to be standing by himself, took out a piece of paper, <clears throat> and spent five or ten minutes writing. And then apparently uh, read what he had written, didn't like it, crumbled it up, and threw it on the ground. A colleague picked it up, read it, and liked it, and sent it to Punch, the literary magazine in Great Britain. And it was published first anonymously and then sub subsequently published thousands of times. And it was a poem that McRae had written called In Flanders Fields. It's recognized as probably being one of the most beautiful poems ever written about war. And it's very fatalistic because everybody who was in World War I in trench well, war warfare knew they were going to die. In Flanders fields the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amidst the guns below. We are the dead short days ago we lived felt dawn saw sunset glow loved and were loved and now lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe to you from failing hands we throw the torch be yours to hold it high if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Now, when Finney got to uh, um, Europe, he learned that McCrae was close by. So he invited uh, McCrae over, and they spent several hours reminiscing about their days back in Hopkins, what they were doing, etc. Now, McCrae didn't know that his poem was subsequently going to be published. And Finney, of course, didn't even know he'd written it. But they reminisced for several hours, had a great time, renewed an old friendship. Several weeks later, McCrae was dead. Dr. Finney, after leaving the uh, armed services uh, in 1920, was offered the chair of surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. And he was devoted to Harvard and to Massachusetts General Hospital but finally decided to turn it down because he loved his private practice and loved his association with not only Hopkins, but the Union Memorial Hospital. Now, a few years later, two years later, when Dr. Halstead died, Dr. Finney was named the interim professor and surgeon in chief of the Johns Hopkins Hospital in the School of Medicine. Uh, they wanted him to take the full-time position but he debated about it and finally decided not to. He didn't like the full-time system that Hopkins had developed. He thought it interfered with the patient-physician relationship. He was 59 years old, uh, which he thought was too old to take the job. And in addition, he would have had to take a huge cut in compensation. So he turned it down. He's the only individual who's turned down the job, was offered the job both at Massachusetts General and at Hopkins and turned them both down. This is a photograph of Halstead's successor in the middle, uh, Dean Lewis, still largely unknown. And to his right, J.M.T. Finney, who at the time was 59, and to Dean Lewis's left, uh, your right, uh, Harvey Cushing. Now, Finney received many honors. He was president, of course, of the American College of Surgeons, the first surgeon, the role model for the college, a great honor, of the Southern Surgical Association, the American Surgical. He was an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, Edinburgh, and Ireland. He won the Bigelow Medal from the Boston Surgical Association, one of the most prominent medals given to surgeons in the United States. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal <coughs> from uh, the United States from his service in World War I and from France, the Legion uh, of Honor. Now this is a, he was received many honorary degrees. Uh, this is uh, Harvard, I think about 1920. In the middle with the C is James Conant, the president, probably Harvard's greatest president. To his left was uh, Robert Frost who was receiving a degree and Finney, so he was in good company. I'm not going to point these people out because it's hard to see, but this is a retirement party at the Maryland Club. Some of you have been to the Maryland Club in Baltimore. And there's Dr. Finney, Cushing, Welch, there are a lot of prominent people from around the country and from Hopkins. 
this is, uh, he retired, he, he did his last operation, I think, at, at 76, and as I continued to operate after 76, people kept bringing this up to me. Now look, at even Finney stopped when he was 76. But this is, uh, this is the uh, Union Memorial, the last operation he did, Dr. Finney Sr., he did uh, a thyroid. But his sons, his two sons who were surgeons, Richard Tillin, a famous gynecologist, Kit Lowski, a plastic surgeon, um, Amos Kuntz, a hernia surgeon, Dick Shackelford, they all did operations at Union Memorial that day to commemorate his last day. Now, one of the reasons we don't remember Dr. Finney well today is he didn't make any um, basic contributions that persisted. He did, do, he did invent the Finney pyloroplasty. And it's pictured here, it's, a, it's not pictured very well, but it's the only picture I could find of it. It's a side-to-side -side anastomosis between the greater curvature of the antrum and the first and second portions of the duodenum, and it makes a huge, huge opening. Now, back in the 70s and early 80s, <clears throat> when I was a junior faculty member, a duodenal ulcer was still common, and we did pyloroplasty and, and vagotomies for it. But we did Heineke miculitzes, which, often um, increased the size of the pylorus and destroyed the muscle, but sometimes even narrowed it. So I thought I'm gonna reestablish the Finney pyloroplasty as the operation of choice. So I did about 15. They all were in the hospital for about three weeks afterwards because this so distorts apparently the peristaltic wave through the stomach into the duodenum that they all had delayed gastric emptying. So after about 15, I finally abandoned the operation and so there's nothing named after Finney that we do any longer. This is Dr. Finney. To his right is J.M.T. Finney, Jr. To his left is George Finney. Now, George Finney was a wonderful person who had all the qualities that J.M.T. Finney, Sr. did. And he was still operating when I was on the house staff, and I had the honor and opportunity of scrubbing with him, usually as a second assistant, uh, uh, hardly able to see the operation itself, but the Finney genes are wonderful genes, and uh, his sons uh, had the same. Now, Dr. Finney believed in taking the whole summer off and getting away from Baltimore far enough so that he couldn't be called back. This is um, Chester, Nova Scotia, and this little teeny island out there was owned by Dr. Finney, and of course, there were no cars, no telephones, no nothing. It was a teeny island, just as depicted, with a house on it. And he'd spend the two months there. The property is still in the Finney family now. The Finney family is still a very prominent family uh, in Baltimore. And he fished. He loved to fish. This is a picture of him with a catch. He had a, uh, a schooner that he loved to take people out on. Now, people kept... Uh, telling him he looked like Teddy Roosevelt. It, and this is his um, depiction of the rough rider, Teddy Roosevelt. He did bear a remarkable resemblance. Uh, this is the Finney home in Baltimore. Still a beautiful, magnificent home. You can't see it, but there are actually two lions uh, guarding the front door. Now, he had many prominent patients, H.L. Mencken, John D. Rockefeller, Franklin D. Roosevelt. When he died at age 79, uh, these are some of the words from obituaries, idealistic in his attitudes, unyielding in his principles, selfless, inspiring young men and women, service to patients, the ideal uh, physician. Now, this is a photograph I took of the Finney plot. It's in Churchville, uh, Maryland, which is close to Bel Air. And on his gravestone, it says, John Miller Turpin Finney, son of Reverend Ebenezer Dickey and Ann Parker Finney, um, 1863 during the uh, Civil War to 1942. And it says, who went around doing good. And there could be nothing more appropriate. Now, he wrote an autobiography, which I've read on several occasions. And this is an important part of his autobiography. We are all in a measure copycats. How often do we see reflected unconsciously perhaps in students and st students certain idiosyncrasies of their teachers? It may be methods of thought, modes of expression, mannerisms, 
poses or whatnot. Therefore, we should conduct ourselves in such ways of thought and action as to make our influence count in the right directions. So he knew all about role modeling before the term role model really uh, was established. And that's why it was picked to be the first president of the American College of Surgeons, because individuals back in that era realized he was the role model that they wanted to extend. Now this is a photograph, the last photograph of J.M. T. Finney uh, when he was uh, in his late 70s. But well, that's the, the story of J.M. T. Finney. He's now looked upon as the other surgeon at the time, but when he was at Hopkins, he was probably the most prominent surgeon and one of the most prominent surgeons uh, in the country as a private practitioner. Now this, just to show the Finney genes are still uh, clicking. This is a picture, I gave this talk, JMT Finney, uh, at Surgical Grand Rounds just a few weeks ago at Hopkins, and in the audience was Stuart Finney. Stuart Finney, of course, went to Princeton. He went to Hopkins to medical school. He trained in general surgery, and he trained in cardiac surgery. And he's a terrific young man, and we wanted him to stay on the full-time staff at Hopkins, but be, he said because his grandfather, great-grandfather, grandfather, and father were all private practitioners, he was gonna be a private practitioner. But he has the same wonderful, I mean, he didn't know his great-grandfather. Uh, from reading, I probably know his great-grandfather better than he does. But Stuart has the same absolute wonderful characteristics that his granddad has. So even though the name is faded, the genes continue on. Thank you very much. What a wonderful talk, uh, as we didn't plan on, but we're ahead of schedule somewhat. So uh, I hope Dr. Cameron will be able to answer any questions. Are there any questions or comments from the audience? Dr. Cameron, good morning. It's, it's, uh, hey, Eddie. It doesn't matter what hour of the day or night, it's always a thrill to hear you talk about surgical history. And I count myself blessed to have heard many such talks. I'd like you to elaborate, if you could, on whether or not we can draw any conclusions from the fact that, uh, you know, I heard words like unyielding, and yet you look at a man born during the height of the Civil War in Mississippi, yet he's on the Board of Trustees at Lincoln, uh, at HBCU. He was, you know, played football, you said, for both Princeton and Harvard. And you and I know, others don't, that this rivalry between McDonough and Gilman is a huge storied rivalry, and yet he's the chair of the Board of Trustees at both institutions. Is this a man that is flexible? How would you, can we draw any conclusions about his personality to be so flexible or loyalties in those directions? Thank you, thank you for your talk. You know, JMT Finney was just a very remarkable individual. Um, I don't know why there aren't more JMT Finneys. I don't know why I can't act like JMT Finney because he just was a wonderful person who got along well with everybody and just had a knack of doing the right thing at the right time and was just a terrific individual. He also, Eddie, uh, was responsible, pr principally responsible for having an African-American uh, surgeon amongst the first surgeons uh, when the, the college was founded. But he, uh, there's nothing that you can point out to say this is the genius in the man. He just, every th time a, an opportunity came along, he did the right thing. And it's just like our parents have told us when we were young, do the right thing every time an opportunity comes up. Well, he had a knack of doing it. Uh, reading about him is a very stimulating experience. He was just a remarkable individual. And amazingly, I don't know if you've read The Master of All Maladies, that author has written a second book called The Gene. And that's much better than the first book. And there's, they've spent a lot of time on chapters of twins separated at birth. And they didn't know they were a twin. And then these studies found them. And it's amazing how many pairs of twins were separated at birth who didn't know they were twins. They were found later and their personalities were identical. And knowing Stuart Fenty today and reading about his great-grandfather, 
The same genes are in there cooking. It wasn't environment, it was genes. And this steward is the same wonderful person that his great-grandfather was. But he, he was a remarkable person. Why there aren't more JMT Finneys, I don't know, Eddie. There should be. Dr. Cameron, thank you very much. You probably have as much insight, if not more, into the personality, the vision, the foresight, the leadership of Dr. Finney. Were he now president today of the American College of Surgeons, looking at some of the splits politically, medically, geographically, on and on and on, what message would he give to us for the next five years? You know, that's a good question. I, he, first of all, he would be loved and respected by all factions. He just was that sort of unifying individual. And um, I don't know what he would think about politically what is going on in the United States today. Um, but he would be working night and day, healing, bringing factions together. He was, uh, you know, I would tell all of you, read his autobiography, but the one thing he didn't excel in was writing. And I've read his autobiography several times. It's not really well written. So I don't want you necessarily to, to read it. But um, to know about him and to read about his life written by others, I, I recommend strongly to you. He's a remarkable person. But uh, his autobiography does show that he is a storyteller. He loved to tell a good story and obviously had a good time no matter what he was doing. That's true. That is true. And I mean, he was a, a congenial individual. The, the only <clears throat> item which he wasn't successful, Calvin Coolidge's son, he was a good friend of Coolidge and was, Coolidge considered him his physician. His son uh, had some sort of minor injury. It became infected and he became septic. <laughs> And this was during the summer when Dr. Finney was in Chester. And even though it wasn't a surgical problem, he called for Finney to come home to look after his boy. And Finney wouldn't come. He wouldn't leave Chester. And the son died. And Coolidge never forgave him. That's the only negative thing I've ever read, heard about uh, Dr. Finney. So. There were not, it wasn't universal, it was, all, it was universal minus one of people who loved and respected him. Okay, thank you very much. What a wonderful talk. Um, Megan's got maps to the, for where to, where to uh, assemble for the buses to the Ether Dome for people who have tickets for that. Uh, a reminder that the uh, sessions for the icons of surgery and the panel session will be in the same room upstairs. I forget the number, but it's going to be one floor up. Uh, thank you very much for a really successful breakfast meeting. Thank you all for coming.